Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Fresh Vision Church. If this is the first time you've joined us and you want to know more about us, the best way you can do that is by going through our, to our website at fvcelp.org. And there you can find all the information uh, you need about our church. Also, you can call us or contact us through email. Um, you can send us a prayer request on that website. And you can also do that by checking out one of our social media pages, whether it's on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Um, and those links, again, will be on our website. And they will also be in the description below. As I've mentioned several other weeks, because of our current situation with the coronavirus, um, we still are not having any live services here. We are praying that this will end soon and that the church will once again be able to gather together. In the meantime, your financial support is appreciated. So if you'd like to send us a small contribution or donation, or if you want to call it a tithe or an offering, we have a PayPal link on our website. And also the link to our PayPal will be at the description, also at the bottom of this video. Again, thank you. We appreciate it. We thank you that you're praying for us. We thank you that you're praying for our city, our state, our nation, for those around the world who are sick and suffering with COVID-19. Ladies and gentlemen, this will end. And God will reveal himself more clearly after this. Let's begin with today's service. This morning, we will begin covering Luke chapter 14. And I titled today's message, A Kingdom of the Humble. As we've already seen in several other occasions in this gospel, Jesus never turned down an invitation, regardless if it was friend or foe. Well, in this chapter, he once again is invited to a meal with some other VIPs of society. At this particular meal, though, he will speak very pointedly to five groups of people. And what he will say will be shockingly honest. In the first section, he will speak to the religious leaders about their false piety. He then will talk to the guests about their miserable manners and methodology. And then will also correct the host who invited him about his wrong motives and hospitality. And in the sec second section, we'll be reading later on, we'll be seeing how he replies to a man who interrupted him regarding his mistaken assumption about his destiny. Now, the fifth group, we'll, we'll be covering that next week, but there he will address the crowd about their need to think carefully. So what I'm hoping you'll see in these passages this morning is that God's kingdom will be made of the selfless and humble and not of the selfish and prideful. So before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this message, Lord, and you bless those that are hearing it right now, Lord. There are many people out there who are listening and watching, and I believe that you have a message directly for them, Lord. So I pray that it go out with power, that you will speak to them clearly, and that they will be blessed by you, Lord, or convicted by you once we're done here, Lord. Use me as your vessel to speak your truth, and may I honor you with everything that I say. Lord, pour your Holy Spirit upon this nation. We ask for revival so that more people will come in and enter your kingdom. Bless this service. Bless this time, Lord. Open our hearts and ears to hear from you now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as I mentioned, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 1. And the word of God says, One Sabbath, when he went in to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day or not? But they kept silent. He took the man, healed him, and sent him away. And to them he said, which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? 
they could find no answer to these things. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't recline at the best place because a more dis distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, give up your place, to give your place to this man. And then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and recline at the lowest table so that when the one who invited you comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, because they might invite you back and you will be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. As I mentioned earlier, here we see the Lord being real and honest towards three groups of people, the religious leaders, the guests, and the host. So let's begin by taking a closer look at what's happening here and what he said first to the legal and religious experts. Luke tells us that one Sabbath day while he was still making his way to Jerusalem, Jesus accepted the invitation to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees. Now, I know that some of you are probably saying, why would he do that again? After several other dinner parties he was invited to had gone sour. Well, it seems to me that the Lord never turned down an invitation from the opposition for a couple of reasons. Number one, he never held a grudge. And number two, he used those opportunities to teach truth and to show them a godly example. On the other hand, like in other instances we've already seen and read about, the religious leaders that had also been there were watching him closely not to satisfy their curiosity or to even learn from him, but to find something to criticize and condemn him for. Nevertheless, he didn't allow the pressure of being scrutinized for everything he said and did stop him from speaking truth and doing what was right. Well, it's unknown what he was doing there or how he got there, but a man whose body was swollen with fluid caught Jesus' attention when he appeared in front of him. In those days, Jews would often view this condition of dropsy as a judgment of God on sin and refusal and for their refusal to obey rabbinic laws. So again, whether his presence there was intentional or unintentional is unclear, but what is clear to Jesus was that this man needed help. Fully aware of what was in the hearts and minds of the law experts and the Pharisees, the Lord asked them, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? The Pharisees were now in a dilemma. To allow healing on the Sabbath violated the traditions that they zealously taught and practiced. Yet, to forbid such healing would make them appear uncompassionate and heartless for a man who was visibly sick. So rather than taking one stand or another and avoid being scrutinized by the public, they chose to remain silent. They chose to say nothing at all. So when no one answered, Jesus once again took the initiative and acted on God's authority. He took the man, healed him, and sent him away. To him, it was a work of mercy and, and divine love never ceases his activities, even on the Sabbath. Then, before they could start attacking him for breaking the Sabbath, Jesus asked them another question. Which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? They were once again backed into a corner. If they say no, 
they would reveal themselves for what they really are, inhumane religious leaders. If they said yes, they would be breaking their own laws governing the Sabbath. Jesus here was making the unarguable point that kindness, compassion, and mercy was far more important than observing the Sabbath. The answer was simple, but those religious leaders can find no answer because they were too stubborn to even accept common sense logic. Now, if you want a bad example of what humility is supposed to look like, all you have to do is look at the attitudes and behaviors of those religious men. In Romans chapter one, verses 29 to 31, Paul gives a list of ne negative characteristics. And among them, these are the ones that I see that they've already displayed. Evil, envy, deceit, malice, arrogant, proud, inventors of evil, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Uh, these characteristics, you, I think it's important to keep in mind when you're dealing with people that you don't necessarily see eye to eye with, people that maybe you don't get along with. You see, even if they despise you, you mustn't return evil for evil. Remind yourselves of what it says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Let me share with you what the great Jonathan Edwards once said. What is the surest character of true, divine, supernatural love that distinguish it from counterfeits that arise from a natural self-love? It is the Christian virtue of humility that shines in it. Divine love abhors all others, renounces and abases what we term self. Christian love or true love is a humble love. In that person, we see a sense of his own smallness, vileness, weakness, and utter insufficiency. We see a lack of self-confidence. We see self-emptiness, self-denial, and poverty of spirit. These are the manifest tokens of the Spirit of God. Now, while they remain silent, the Lord turned his attention towards another group who were there. It says in verse 7 that he told a parable based on how he had seen them choose the best places for themselves around the table that was there. In Jesus' day, as it is in many places, there were status symbols that helped people to enhance and protect their high standing in society. If you were invited at the right home, and if you were, and if you were seated at the right places, then people would know how important you really are. The emphasis was on reputation, not character. It was more important to sit at the right places and to live the right kind of life. Also, in New Testament times, the closer you sat to the host, the higher you stood on the social ladder, and the more attention or invitations you would receive from others. So naturally, many people rushed to the head table once the doors opened because they wanted to be important. Now, even though he was one of many guests, the best seat mattered little to Jesus. And political correctness wasn't going to keep him from speaking what was true and what was right. So he used that moment to warn them against pride and selfishness. In the parable, he told them that when they are invited to a wedding banquet, they should take the lowest place rather than the best place. The reason being that when one seeks the most honorable position, they may be demoted to a lower position and will eventually feel humiliated when that happens. However, if one sets himself up in the lowest place, they might be promoted to a higher one and then be honored in front of all the other guests. So the lesson here is this, shame, will often follow self 
exaltation. When we allow others, especially God, to promote and lift us up, then we don't have the same danger of being exposed as someone who has exalted himself. So instead of playing the promotion game, we ought to work hard and do it for the Lord and allow him to raise us up. It says in Psalm 75, six through seven, exaltation does not come from the east, the west or the desert for God is the judge. He brings down one and exalts another. So if we're truly humble before God, there's only one direction we can possibly move, and that's up. You see, it's better to be advanced to a place of honor than to grasp that place and then later relinquish it. Now, one other lesson is found here, and that is to be content in whatever place God gives you. If it's in a lower position than what you expected, then esteem those who God has placed in a higher position. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul wrote, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. If God has placed you in a high position, always be grateful and maintain an attitude of sincere humility after washing his disciples' feet. Christ said this in John chapter 13, verses 14 and 15. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done for you. Jesus then states the principal message of this parable in verse 11. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The general meaning of this verse is simple. He's explaining to his listeners here that if someone tries to gain honor for themselves, they'll be humbled and humiliated. But if someone shows humility, then they'll receive great honor. As Christians, we can apply this by acting in humility, not pride, in whatever situation and position we find ourselves in. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Now this verse here, verse 11, is also speaking of Jesus being the living example of self-renunciation. You see, he was the ultimate example of someone who deserved the highest place but took the lowest place and was granted the highest place. Let me read to you what it says in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus who existed in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by, be, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God, the Father. Well, having taught the guests a lesson on humility, the Lord then speaks directly to the Pharisee who had invited him over to eat. Jesus knew that the host had invited other guests for two reasons, either to pay them back for having invited him to pass feasts or to put them under his debt so that they would invite him to future feasts. This kind of hospitality has nothing to do with love and grace, but rather all about pride and selfishness. He was essentially buying and selling recognition. Jesus here could see right through the fakeness and also saw how the underprivileged people of the community weren't being included. He therefore took that moment to teach one of the greatest principles of Christianity that we should love those who are unlovely 
and who cannot repay us back. Using the example of a meal, Jesus noted that typically people will invite their friends, relatives, and rich neighbors hoping to be repaid in return. Now this kind of behavior isn't unusual and it doesn't make one more special or holy in God's eyes when they do something like that. But it's positively supernatural to show kindness to the poor, maimed, lame, or blind. This pleases the Lord and moves Him to bless you. See, there's something wonderful about giving a gift that can't be repaid. The feeling you get from doing that is some of the more blessing Jesus spoke about when he said in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This also helps explain some of the pleasure of God in giving the gift of salvation and blessing to his people. Jesus then goes on to say in verse 14 that although such guests cannot repay us, God himself promises to reward at the resurrection of the righteous. This is also known in the scriptures as the first resurrection, which will occur at the rapture prior to the tribulation period. Here's how 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 describes that day and moment. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Here again, Jesus shows us the importance of living with an eternal perspective. In other words, we must look beyond this short temporal life. So if your focus is on the future glory that awaits you, then what you could get from others shouldn't be the motive of your generosity. Rather, your motive to be generous will come from an unselfish and pure heart. And with a heart like that, you'll find yourself more concerned about sacrifice and service than you will be about profit and loss. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6 says, don't neglect to do what is good and to share. God is pleased with such sacrifices. So if you want to know what a kingdom of the humble will look like, it'll be a kingdom of sincere charity and selfish generosity. Let me read to you one more passage that describes this in Matthew chapter 25. And here's how the Lord describes it beginning in verse 31. When the, son, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When, we, when did we see you sick, or in prison, and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Well, you'd think that after saying all this, the meal would be over, and that would be it. But it wasn't. As we're about to see, Jesus had another parable for them. So if you still have your Bibles with you, let's continue reading from verse 15. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he told him, 
a man was giving a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. I ask that you excuse me. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I just got married and therefore I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. Master, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, has been done and there's still room. Then the master told the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and make them come in so that, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of these people who were invited were in, will enjoy my banquet. In this final section we'll be covering today, Jesus corrects an unidentified guest about his false assumptions regarding God's future heavenly banquet and explains to him how God's kingdom will be filled by the humble. While still at the dinner, Luke tells us that after hearing what Jesus had said, a man who was there, one of the guests, excitedly pronounced a blessing to those who will eat the bread, who will eat bread at the kingdom of God. Now it's unclear whether he was sincere or if he was just trying to draw attention to himself or perhaps he just wanted to break the tension that was there in the room. Regardless of that guest's motives, Jesus responded with another banquet-themed parable. The Lord tells the story of a man who was preparing a large banquet and had, and had invited many to it. When he was done, with the preparations, he sent his servants out to inform those who were invited that it was time to come because everything was ready. Now as if they all had agreed with one another not to go, they all began to make excuses why they couldn't come. One had to go inspect a field that he had just purchased. The next one said he had bought five yoke of oxen and wanted to try them out. And a third said that he wasn't able to come because he had just gotten married. Upon being notified of this, the master of the house was livid. He told his servant to go out into the streets and alleys and bring the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. After doing that, the servant informed the master that, that there was still plenty of room in the banquet hall. So the master ordered him to go out into the highways and hedges and make them come and make them come in so that his house may be filled. He then states that those people who were originally invited had missed out and would not enjoy his banquet because they didn't want to be there. The lesson Jesus wanted everyone at that dinner table to learn was this. Those who think they have a place reserved and assured in the heavenly feast will find themselves on the outside looking in, just as the poor, needy, and outcasts previously stood at their windows looking in on their banquets. Now the meaning and application of the parable became obviously clear when Jesus revealed in verse 24 that he was talking about my banquet. Thus, the story symbolizes being invited to the messianic banquet in the future kingdom of God. Those who were initially invited represent the upper class Jews who were so tied to their social status, their financial businesses, and family matters that they snubbed God. And therefore, God rejected them and turned to the very ones the Jewish leaders looked on with contempt to find adequate guests for the heavenly banquet. So why 
Did the master choose the poor, maimed, blind, and lame? Well, it could be that the poor aren't distracted by material possessions. The maimed won't be harnessing oxen. And the blind and lame, honestly at that time, were less likely to be married. In other words, the servants were to invite those who weren't distracted by possessions, vocation, and affections. He wanted to invite those who wouldn't make ludicrous excuses, who wouldn't be sidetracked by the things of the world, who would have a heart for heaven and a sensitivity towards the things of the kingdom. That is why Paul would later say to the early church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. The other invitation God issues is to a wider group of people from all other places. These people represent the Gentiles who would receive the gospel message, believe it, and be saved by it so that his kingdom may be filled. Now, Jesus mentioned this before, back in chapter 13, verse 29. And there he said, they will come from the east and west, from the north and south, to share the banquet in the kingdom of God. Now, when Jesus said, make them come, he's not suggesting that this be done by coercion, manipulation, or by physical force. The Lord never has and never will force anyone to believe in Him. So what He's implying there is to use compelling arguments in order to persuade them to come using compassion and love. This leads me to share with you how this parable applies to you. So whether you're a born-again believer or not, there's a lesson in here for you. First of all, as I mentioned, if you're a believer, the gospel message ought to be proclaimed with a compelling manner to the wanderers and outcasts of this world. With a loving persuasion, convince them to come into the Master's house so that it may be filled. Let them know about the importance of accepting God's free invitation into His eternal glory and how Jesus had to die for them in order to make that happen. And as servants of the Master, He's sending you out to those areas of the world He's put you at so that you may bring the spiritually poor, the spiritually blind, the, the spiritually maimed, the spiritually lame, to him and those who are willing he will receive and they will enjoy his banquet but those who had excuses not to come will find themselves without a seat at the Lord's table the message of this parable also applies to all lost sinners today God still says come Everything is now ready. You see, nothing more needs to be done for the salvation of your soul. Jesus Christ completed the work of redemption when He hung on the cross and said, It is finished. And at this very moment, the food on the banquet table is spread out. The invitation has been sent, and all you have to do is accept it and come. Don't make the same mistake that the people of this parable made. They delayed in responding to the invitation because they settled for second best. Now, let me just say this. There's nothing wrong with owning a farm or owning property or owning land, examining purchases or spending an evening with your wife. Yes, good things can come from these. But if these good things keep you from enjoying the best things, then they become bad things. So the bottom line is this. Jesus here is speaking of heaven, of salvation, of eternity. 
of matters of the greatest possible significance. So I urge you now not to allow another day go by by saying, sorry, I just don't have time. This parable was the text of the last sermon D.L. Moody preached, Excuses. It was given on November 23rd, 1899, in the Civic Auditorium in Kansas City. And Moody was, sick, was a sick man as he preached. Never, never have I wanted so much to lead men and women to Christ as I do at this time. There was throbbing in his chest and he had to hold on to the organ to keep from falling. But Moody bravely preached the gospel, and some 50 people responded to trust Christ. The next day, Moody went home, and a month later, he died. Up to the very end, Moody was compelling them to come in. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm now coming to you and compelling you to come in. The door is open. And there's a place reserved for you at the Lord's table. The question is, will you come in and dine with Him? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, No eye has seen, nor ear, no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived. God has prepared these things for those who love Him. If you're willing to come, there's only one way to get in, through Jesus Christ. Jesus said in chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In order to go through him, you must come to the cross of Jesus. Repent of your sins, surrender your life to him, and be born again. So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're ready to do that now, you understand your need for a Savior, you know that there's nothing you can do or will do to get you into the kingdom of God. And you want, but you want to be there. You want to enjoy the heavenly banquet that awaits those who trust in Him, believe in Him, and obey in Him, and obey Him, then let me lead you in a prayer to do that. Let me lead you in a prayer to accept the invitation so that you may come in and sit at the Lord's table. So wherever you're at, and close your eyes and bow your heads and if you can, if you're willing, you can kneel down. And with all sincerity, with all your heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that, let us know. Contact us. I want to hear from you. You can message us, send us you can message us through our website or send us a message on social media. Um, let us know so that we can help direct you in your next steps of your new Christian life. If I have to, I'll lead you. I'll tell you about uh, a church in your area where you can go or you can come here. You'll always be welcome here. Our doors will be open to you. But yeah, send us a message. Let us know. We want to hear all about it. Now before I close this service in prayer, I hope the Spirit has made it abundantly clear through these two passages that God's kingdom will be a kingdom of the humble. There won't be a single person there with a hint of pride and selfishness because they will completely understand 
that they did nothing to deserve being there. All they did was accept the invitation and enter in. And once they get inside, they will find themselves surrounded by others just like them and enjoying a beautiful, wonderful banquet. It will be a kingdom full of loving, merciful, compassionate, selfless, grateful, and humble saints. Then, when they finally see the Master, when they finally see Jesus Christ face to face, they will know that the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is indeed the servant of all. Now since this is what it will be like, it's important that you start cultivating humility right now. And you can do that by practicing these six things. Pray. Number one, pray for more humility. Number two, understand God's omnipotence. In other words, understand God's greatness, His power, His glory. And as you begin to understand that, compare that to who you are. And then you'll start to understand what humility really is. Number three, know your weaknesses and limitations. Be aware of them. Number four, don't demand privileges. Number five, think better of others than yourself. And number six, live every day as much as possible at the foot of the cross. I'll end with this one final quote from D.L. Moody. A man can counterfeit love. He can counterfeit faith. He can counterfeit hope and all the other graces. But it's very difficult to counterfeit humility. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, thank you for this morning and thank you for your word and this message. I pray that those who are hearing it and, and, and watching it, Lord, that they were blessed, that they received it, and they got a message from it, Lord, that you spoke to them powerfully. I pray for those who are out there that are struggling right now, Lord. I pray that they may fall on, your knee, on their knees and ask for forgiveness. And they may experience and understand and know the full weight of your mercy and compassion. Pray for those who are sick and hurting right now, Lord, who are going through tribul turbulent times, who may be going through persecution. I pray that you comfort them and that you strengthen them, Lord. Remind them of all your beautiful promises and remind them that you are true, that you don't lie, and that you will keep them or you will keep us, your promises to them. We pray for those who may be lying in hospital beds right now with the coronavirus or some other disease or virus or, or sickness, Lord. I pray that you will heal them and that you will strengthen them and that you will embrace them with your mighty arms. May they find comfort under the shadow of your wings. We look forward to one day sitting at the banquet table with you. We look forward to meeting one another in your glorious kingdom. In the meantime, continue to build us up Help us to grow, Lord. Help us to be more humble. Help us to look out for one another's best interests, not for our own, but for the other person's. Prepare us, Lord, for that moment and that day when we finally see you face to face. 
We love you and praise you, Lord. Thank you for making us your children. Thank you for all you've done in our lives. Use us now to make an impact on others, to invite others into your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.